Hello, my name is John Omaha, and I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. And I am also the creator of Affect-Centered Therapy. And I want to take some time here to introduce you to Affect-Centered Therapy, give you a little bit of background uh, in how it works, why it works, and what it can do for you, and then explain some of the techniques and uh, structure them around, loosely around, little bits and pieces of clinical work. So the important thing about affect-centered therapy is that it's based on a model that appears to be accurate, a model for human development. It's a developmental model, which says that people, the problems that bring people to therapy have their origin in their childhood experiences. And actually, beginning at birth, if not a little bit before. So it's important, I want to get across a concept here, uh, the concept of the unconscious. See, Freud had it wrong. He thought reasonably, but he thought that the unconscious was the place where uh, the ego put it, the things that were unacceptable to it. Well, modern uh, neuropsychology has discovered that the unconscious is formed in the first four to five years of life. It begins. It's the basis that's laid down. We humans are map makers. And a newborn child beginning at birth and continuing forward is making maps about the world. These are maps of what do I need to do to avoid pain? What do I need to do to uh, uh, receive pleasure? And so the child is always watching mom at the beginning and then mom and dad and then sisters and then everybody else to understand how the world works. And during the first four years of life, those lessons, first four to five, those lessons are stored in the brain, but because the brain's not capable at that age of making um, narrative memories, they're stored in the unconscious. And they're, they're not stored as words, they're stored as images and emotions and pictures that go along with them. And then later in life, these unconscious, uh, one word is a map, another word is a schema, they become the basis for perceptions, how one, what one sees in the world, uh, for motivation, for action, for thoughts, for sensations and emotions and the meaning that we make of life. And so um, this is really important. I'll give you a quick example. Let's suppose that, and I have many clients in this where this has happened, that uh, for these purposes, we're thinking of a female client and mom had an affair. Uh, sorry, male client. Mom had an affair and it caused mom and dad to break up. This young person, that's what he learns about the world, that moms have affairs and moms and dads split up. He becomes an adult now and his perception is clouded by that unconscious schema. And so he looks at his wife who's just in a restaurant looking around and he perceives her to be checking out other men in the restaurant. I hope that makes that clear. Um, there are two circuits, I'll say this pretty quickly, but two circuits in the brain that uh, optimize pleasure and reduce pain. And uh, those cir the circuits are automatic. Uh, they're rigid, they just don't change. They're not open to being evaluated for the most part. Uh, they're very, very fast and uh, they're driven by emotions. And so then there's one circuit in the brain that does give the ability to, to, dis, to uh, evaluate whether a behavior is working or not. But that circuit is very, very slow. And so, for example, take a person who's addicted to um, some drug, say methamphetamine or alcohol. Uh, the person's addiction, as we'll see presently, is driven by emotions and by these unconscious schemas uh, that I've been discussing. And they're deployed very rapidly. And so the person uh, 
taken on Friday afternoon and the person is thinking, uh, I feel a little uncomfortable, the weekend's coming up, my parents used to drink and use on the weekends, so there's the schema, what will I do with my weekend? And almost instantly, the unconscious plan or map is saying, go to the dealer's house, go to the bar. And that's almost, that's instant, and it's not evaluated by the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex can say, hey, wait a minute, dude, what are you doing? However, our client here has already headed to the bar or to the drug dealers. So it's important to get this, the, this uh, interplay or lack of it between the unconscious motivations and the uh, evaluation function in the prefrontal cortex. So now, how does this all come down to therapy? When clients come in to my office, they are, they've come because they're having the, some emotion has come up for them that is too painful and they need to deal with it. Perhaps they got a nudge from the judge, but it's still a painful emotion. Uh, they're going to have to go to jail, perhaps, or they're facing uh, jail time, or they're facing a spouse who is upset with them. They come in for a variety of reasons. Uh, the affect-centered therapy I've created, I've used it for alcoholism, all of the addictions, eating disorders, depression, anxiety, uh, compulsive use of pornography, and the like. So these are some of the problems that people bring to me. Now, that we'll call that the presenting problem. Uh, now, the client comes, and one of the things I tell all my clients, and um, we'll discuss this, but is that, um, all, client, all of my clients are uh, aligned or alike in one important regard, and that is that they uh, are not able to recognize, tolerate, and regulate a range of emotions. And why is that? Well, that's why I explained all that stuff about the unconscious first. Their emotion regulation is uh, not a conscious phenomenon for them. And so, I bring the first skills I teach all my clients are the skills of emotion regulation. Uh, I call this affect management skills training. And uh, so we do, uh, and the, the purpose of the skill of this skill training is first of all, to raise to aware, raise for the client to his or her awareness what the sensations are that the, by which the body is telling the client he or she feels a range of emotions. Uh, the ones we work on are fear, anger, sadness, emotion that I call attachment, which is the basis of our love relationships, and then disgust and shame. There are, uh, that's, there are other, four other emotions, but we don't usually work on them. So, uh, the first skill I teach the client is, this, is called containment. And I ask the client to give me a container. This might be a dumpster or a safe, a walk-in safe, where we put away every disturbing thing. The important thing, and this gives the brain a, a little bit of rest, because the way brains work is the material of a person's life is constantly circulating, and it affects behavior all of the time, even if you're not aware of it. So what I do is I help them create this container and we put away all the disturbing material because quite frankly, they're not yet emotionally prepared to work on it. So then the second skill is called safe place. And safe place, many of my clients were raised in environments that simply were not emotionally safe. Whether dad was a rageaholic or whether he was absent or whether he just left the family uh, whether mom was a rageaholic, whether it was alcoholism, addiction, or the like, it simply wasn't a safe place. One of the things that's come out in the literature recently is the concept of the emotionally immature parent. And many, many clients were raised by emotionally immature parents, and they're the adult children of emotionally immature parents. That's the title of the book. Uh, if you're interested, you could look it up. So, um, 
I then teach them the skills, the skills of the safe place. I ask them to give me an image of a place that they've been in adulthood where they knew they were safe. Usually we get places here in Northern California like uh, Armstrong Woods State Park or out at the ocean at the one of the beaches along the coast of the Pacific here. But sometimes it's waterfalls or mountaintops. We help the client develop that image, then associate it. And I want you to notice as I'm telling you this, first comes the image, then comes the thought. Uh, and this is really working with the brain the way it operates. Uh, we assemble the image with the thought, I am safe. And then, we, then once we've uh, made, uh, arrived at certainty for that, then we assemble it with a, an emotion-based statement, I feel safe. And so now we've brought the, part of the, brain, the parts of the brain in that uh, register and generate emotion. Previously, we had worked with the parts that generate thought, and then pre pre we started with the part of the brain, the hippocampus, that generates uh, images. And so now we bring in the emotion itself and then help the person identify the sensations of safety, which they've never done before, or very rarely. And so uh, we help them identify those, and then we've got all the parts. Thinking, image, thinking, uh, emotion and sensation. We assemble those into an image with a cue word and then to help the client, coach the client in various contexts to use that image. Like for example, one of the beaches here is called Goat Rock. Uh, I can use my Goat Rock to stay say, to uh, create safety for myself when I see my ex-husband. It's a good example. So having done that, now we start working on the emotions themselves. And there are several, there are five skills here. What, how does the body tell the person they are experiencing the emotion of fear, for example? And I ask them to give uh, a recent time, for example, seeing a police officer in your rear view mirror. That's often a low level of fear for people. And we identify the sensations. And those sensations are usually more rapid beating heart, shallower breathing, uh, sometimes sweaty palms. Then we, uh, so then the, that's the skill of emotion recognition. Then the skill is, the next skill is to be able to stay grounded and present while, feel, while experiencing that emotion. And this is what most people uh, have difficulty doing and why they come to therapy. Um, they didn't learn these skills in childhood, and worse, the parents uh, or the world uh, produced experiences in which they had uh, uh, that generated intense amounts of emotion. So, um, and they didn't learn how to stay grounded and present. So, we teach this skill, and I offer the client a range. They might use redwood roots or oak roots emerging from their feet. Sometimes people uh, visualize themselves scrunching their feet in the sand. Clients of mine who are, uh, do yoga, I have them visualize uh, doing a yoga pose uh, while seated on the bare earth. Uh, another one that works for clients who've done uh, martial arts is, for example, the horse stance. So those are the images now or that the person brings up and now I ask them to visualize the say let's focus on the oak roots visualize the oak roots emerging from their feet and then move their awareness inside the body and notice what sensations they're feeling in their feet ankles calves and thighs and people usually get a, uh, a sensation of stability strength warmth, a pulling down. Those are all the kinds of sensations that people feel. And then uh, we assemble the image of the grounding resource, the roots growing out of the feet, uh, with the sensations using a thought. Uh, the, the sensation of stability in my feet and ankles and calves tells me I'm grounded and present. 
Now they have this and that they can use for all time. The next skill is a skill to just notice themselves feeling uh, uh, the emotion of fear. And then the last one is a disposal resource. Usually we use a sink disposal to dispose of the excess emotion. Now that the client has this, we can, the client can use it uh, in all of their relations. Uh, and certainly when they feel like using or overeating or uh, in uh, conflict with uh, a spouse, for example. So that's the first part of our work. Un uh, t remediating deficits in emotion regulation. The second part of the work is to uncover the trauma or adversity or misfortune that happened to the client in childhood that set them on a pathway towards their presenting problem. In order to do this, we begin with the presenting problem, whether it's depression or eating disorder. I'm gonna give an example of a depressed man presently. Uh, and to illustrate this, when I use an empty chair, I'll set a chair up facing the client, ask them to put the, for the purposes of this example, uh, depression in the empty chair. Then we get, we uh, uncover a great deal of information. Uh, what does depression know about the client? And then what uh, does depression know about itself? Um, what does, uh, what does the depression feel towards or for the client? What does depression feel about itself? Then I turn that around and ask the same questions of the client. Now we have, we, I call this opening the neural network. Uh, the depression is a set of memories, emotions, sensations, and beliefs that are assembled into a neural network and we have just opened it with those questions. Now we enter that neural network. I ask the client to, uh, again, with the target of depression, what, do, what negative belief do I hold about myself? Um, I am bad, I'm wrong, I'm flawed, I'm a failure. Those are some common ones. What would the client like to believe? Well, I'm a success, I'm whole, I'm complete. Uh, what emotions come up? Usually shame uh, and sadness where they feel that in their body. Well, they've already been helped to get into their body so they can do that. And how intense is it on, this ten, on an 11 point scale from zero to 10? So having done that, now we enter the neural network. I ask them to hold the target of depression, the negative belief, I'm a failure, for example. And I use a device called a TheraTapper that gives an alternating bilateral tactile stimulation through probes that are held in the hand. And um, we go, we start from the present using that image, that negative belief, and we float back through time to the earliest time that we can, that the client can access, usually at age four or five are the early, or generally the kinds of targets that people get. And they get an experience from that time, or they recall an image or a memory from that time that uh, is related to their depression, their, uh, the emotion of, uh, the thought I'm a failure and the emotion of sadness and shame. And then we do, uh, there's a resolving piece here. I ask, the, and I ask the adult client to enter into a scene where the, that we have uncovered. For example, um, I'm thinking of, uh, of a uh, client uh, eating disordered client uh, who uh, at uh, age four was sitting in the back seat of the car, father was driving, uh, mother was smoking the windows, cigarettes, the windows were rolled up and the client began to get violent, physically sick, nauseous. And she pleaded with her father to pull over uh, and pleaded with her mother to roll the windows down. And, the father refused to pull over and the mother wouldn't roll the windows down and the client threw up. 
Well, this became the basis of the purging phase of her bulimic disorder. Just giving you an example of the kinds of things that people can access. There's always something, it's never failed that we find it. And so uh, then we resolve it. There's uh, the, the child part, the child has never been able to tell its story or express its emotion. And so these are the two, the f two, uh, the first two of the four interventions. The whole idea of this is to establish a relationship between what some therapists call the inner child, the memories from childhood, and the adult client. And um, there's plenty of good evidence that the when a child is um, abused or maltreated like this woman was, the child part goes into exile in the personality and it takes with it spontaneity, creativity, and play. And the adult continues to grow, but the child part holding all of those emotions is in exile. Periodically those emotions escape and they become the basis of the presenting problem. So we resolve the childhood experience by allowing the child to express its emotion to the parents in the empty chair, then to like, I feel really angry that you wouldn't roll the windows down, mom, and I feel really angry, dad, that you wouldn't pull over so uh, I didn't have to throw up. And then the third part is allowing the child part to finally tell its story. Alice Miller has said that children, that clients come to therapy and they've been telling their story from childhood in the only way they knew how. And this bulimic client was telling that same story over and over and over again in the only way she knew how through binging and purging. And uh, we give the child now an opportunity to express itself in a new way to somebody, to a trusted person with, who has perfect compassion. And then lastly, we complete the bonding with the adult parent, with the adult uh, client to uh, the bond between the child and the client and have the adult tell the child part, you are innocent, you are pure, you're perfect just the way you are, you deserve all good things. It was not your fault that your dad wouldn't pull over and your mom wouldn't roll the windows down. And I love you unconditionally. I'm gonna take really good care of you from now on. And this begins the bonding between these two. So that's the second phase. And now what we're gonna do is go into the third phase. I'm gonna give you some examples here. This is a treatment of a major depressive disorder. Uh, Phil is the client and when he came to me, he had just failed a few classes in college and uh, because he was unable to get out of bed for a period of two months. His safe place, what he used as a container uh, a standing safe, and he got uh, most. He got eighty percent of his material in there. His safe place was a redwood forest. His grounding resource was redwood roots emerging from his feet, and these are some of the uh, sensations he felt. For fear, he felt a faster beating in his heart, the faster breathing in his lungs. For anger, he felt clenching in his jaw and rigidity in his back and neck. For sadness, tearing up in his eyes and heaviness in his chest. Attachment was a spreading warmth in his heart. Shame was a rolling forward in his shoulders and a sinking in his chest. Disgust was a tightening in his throat. And excitement was a swirling in his solar plexus. Now, the when we put depression in the empty chair, depression says, Phil overthinks things. He keeps himself self safe, pardon me, he keeps himself safe from shame and embarrassment by overthinking. Phil's parents really pushed him to be success uh, and he is overwrought and anxious. Phil, the, the let's see, it also thinks that he holds back 
in school and he's depressed, so he'll have an excuse if he fails. Uh, the pressure to succeed, depression tells him, is, is largely the cause of his depression. Phil doesn't know who he is. Phil's intelligence has been turned into a, a product, a commodity, and he doesn't like that. So um, the depression says about itself, well, I, I use social media to numb him out. Phil was addicted to uh, things like TV and Facebook. And I allow him to stop being turned into a commodity by ruining his specialness. Uh, feels sadness towards Phil, and it feels guilty and powerful towards itself. Now, I do the same questions for Phil, and then we get his, uh, we, with the target, I already described this process, but his target was depression, his negative belief was, I am broken, with emotions of helpless, helpless and sadness, but he feels a hollowness in his chest. And he, when we do the float vaccine, he finds a, seen when he's eight years old and he's watching his parents fight with his uh, brother. And his feeling, he feels angry and anxious and he thinks, I will never create those types of problems. I am a better child. He was not emotionally safe feeling this and uh, his parents, he realizes, were not responsible for the eight-year-old's emotional well-being. So the consequences, he could not admit to having similar problems to his uh, brother who was special needs. He had to be good at everything he did. He was stressed all the times. Uh, he quit activities because if he couldn't be the uh, completely successful, he quit. So we stated those awarenesses and resolved that now we do the very last part. We raise to awareness some of the uh, maps he learned. If, if I, this is the sentence uh, stem completion approach. If I put myself in a depression trance, I'll, he completes that, I'll stop making the effort. Then I'll have an excuse for failing and I won't feel shame and anxiety. And when we disappear the symptom, then he feels contentment, pride, and effectiveness. And so we give, this is part of the coherence therapy, we give him a card. Even though it costs me feeling contentment, pride, and effectiveness, when life is challenging, I put myself in a depression trance where I shut down, distract myself with social media, and avoid responsibility so I won't have to feel shame and anxiety. He's meant to read that card uh, several times a day and to integrate it into his daily functioning. And that when he came back a, a week or so later, he had had an experience where he was able to study, where he, was, where he didn't put himself in the depression trance. And this is the transformation card from coherence therapy. It's called a mismatch. I am becoming aware that when life is challenging I'm, and I'm not meeting my and my parents' expectations, I have put myself in a depression trance where I act out angrily against myself. And then this is the new knowing. And now I feel optimistic, knowing I can stop the onset of a depression trance. I can do a healthy activity and change my headspace. I feel present, calm, and contented, and I realize I am growing. So this is the, an overview of the affect-centered therapy approach. Um, uh, it's turned out to be uh, clinically very valuable to my clients. It takes, uh, the goal of this therapy is autonomy. To raise to awareness these unconscious schemas, to raise to awareness emotion and its regulation, and to uh, the, and then to achieve a state of autonomy where the client can regulate and make choices about his or her behavior, choices from a state of wholeness, choices from a state of a complete of a complete personality, uh, without 
hearts being in control. So uh, thank you very much for taking the time to look at my video. Uh, I hope that you have found this valuable.